<laughs> All right. Well, that's fine. I think most people know Mathieu, Dr. Le Maire. Uh, he and I completed fellowship at around the same time at SickKids, and he went to Yale, somewhere prestigious after that, to pursue a PhD in investigative medicine uh, with a focus of the genetics of rare pediatric kidney diseases, and then returned in 2014 as an assistant professor uh, with his research focus being unraveling the genetic etiology and pathophysiology of rare genetic conditions that affect the kidney. Um, I, I think it's worth noting that, yeah, Mathieu has been involved with the CCHCSB for as long as I have, right, Mathieu? What was, what was your initial involvement with them was as a fellow, as a funded fellow? Uh, no, it was as a new investigator. New, okay, so they, as an early career. I think, yeah, I think at the time you could not do a PhD uh, with CCHCSB. If you were funded by a different, yeah, yeah, if you were funded by a different program. Sounds good. Um, but he's certainly been involved for a very long time. And uh, I think this is a great opportunity to learn what it takes to be a basic science researcher and succeed as a clinician scientist uh, in that field. Even if you're not a basic scientist like myself, I think we'll all learn from what techniques are currently being used and some of the, the modern modern techniques. So take it away, much too. Uh, thanks, Eric. So um, yeah, so I'm a, I'm a nephrologist. Um, I also have some background in cell biology, biochemistry, genetics. Um, and at the end of the day, I sort of bring it all together in the lab and I try to do something that uh, I guess the buzzword these days is translational, where it's supposed to go back to the clinic at some point. Uh, and I would encourage you to give me feedback for this uh, lecture because it's the first time I'm giving it. and. Uh, same thing for the um, the handout because they're they're similar and different. So uh, and there's uh, quite a few things that we're not going to cover that are in the handout. Um, but the way I kind of structured it is uh, I purposefully covered sort of the key techniques that are used to unravel biological problems. As you can see in the handout, if you've received it. Um, it's a, this is just a brief description uh, of the uh, of each uh, technique, and I'm providing you as well with a, a quite a few links to a website that I'm, I'm you might have never heard about. It's called Jovi, or Journal of Visualized Experiments, and it's uh, it's an interesting journal where they uh, you can submit basically papers that are in large part a video. Uh, a fairly high quality. I think somebody has their microphone on. If you could just, uh, Linda, can you zap everybody's mic except mine? Done. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, and uh, so they have actually a pretty good series that's called the uh, uh, education series or whatever. It covers basically all aspects of research, mostly basic science, but not only basic science, there's uh, some clinical research as well. And it's fairly well done, uh, I have to say. And so we'll use some of these clips in, in the presentation here. Those are pretty short. They'll give you a flavor of the type of video that you have. And it's kind of nice to see, especially for uh, things that are more practical to see how it's done and in a, in a, in a sort of concise package. And I gave you way more links in the, in the document. So if you want, if you have some extra time and you want to just uh, review some concepts or, or you're reading a paper and you don't understand some things, chances are this uh, website will give you access to knowledge that is relevant. All you need really, if you have UFT, you have a free access to that. So you just need to log in with your UFT email. If you're not at UFT, chances are your library is uh, subscribing to it and you also have free access, but it's, I think it's almost all Canadian university libraries that subscribe to this uh, website. The other thing that I'm providing you with uh, is uh, just for a brief amount of time, and I'll probably put it password protected with everybody's email uh, from that I'll receive from Linda is a, a few chapters uh, for a book. Uh, basically, it's called Basic Science for the Clinician, uh, for cl clinicians basically, or clinician researchers. And, and it's the same thing, except in this case, it's chapter form. So, um, so and the way I wanted to structure this is I thought it, I, I could do it two ways. I could just 
blab about the different techniques and uh, bore you to to help uh, with things. And my feeling is these things make a lot more sense when they're uh, discussed in the context of something concrete. Uh, so we'll talk about, uh, it's actually a three patients, not one patient, and a novel disease. We'll, that we'll use that as an excuse to co cover some basic concepts of cell biology and as well some uh, basic science tools that can be used to elucidate a novel gene disease association. The techniques that will be discussed today, uh, DNA sequencing, polymerase chain reaction, immunostaining, western blotting, immortalized cell lines, and cell transduction. Things that we will not talk about, but is covered in the document. ELISA, uh, animal models, flow cytometry, and situ hybridization. So this covers sort of the gamut of the, the core sort of techniques that you should probably know uh, if you want to, let's say one of your colleagues is a basic scientist and is doing journal club and is boring you to, or used to bore you with uh, these basic science papers because you don't, didn't really understand what was going on. Well, now you may have a better idea and you, you can uh, maybe enjoy it a little bit more. Uh, or maybe you can even, uh, I think I would say that the best thing you, you could do is actually uh, present at uh, your clinical journal club a basic science paper. Uh, you will learn an awful lot about, about this and you will see that it's not that uh, difficult to do. Uh, okay. So this is actually based on a paper from 2017, published in Nature Communication, uh, from a failed number of uh, sick investigators, including Walter Carr, whom so, some of you probably know as a staff uh, hematologist. Uh, and I just picked that paper because I, the title of my talk was uh, said Hemog Fellows, but I, I, I hear it's way more than that. But I just decided to pick a paper that's related to, to you guys. Uh, and basically, it's actually initially two children with micro microchromocytopenia, eosinophilia, and inflammatory disease. So that means they have very small uh, platelets, so that's the microchromocytopenia. They have a large number of eosinophils that are inflammatory cells, and they have a lot of inflammatory problems like vasculitis and things like that. And you can see from the skin lesions that it's uh, not a happy uh, disease. And in fact, there turned out to be a third child, which was a sibling of one of the indexed patients. Uh, this collection of symptoms did not fit in any di diagnostic box. So the investigators ended up doing what we call whole exome sequencing to try to find what was the, you know, the genetic cause. Uh, and that was some history of consanguinity. So they knew that there, it might be something genetic. So we'll. So we'll do our first trial of uh, these videos. So this is a small interlude just to introduce uh, DNA mutation. We'll see how that's going to go. And if you, I guess we could have, uh, can you hear that? No, we can't hear anything if there's sound, Mathieu. Oh, Usually you with Zoom. No, with Zoom, when you hit like, when you select share screen, there's a little checkbox oh. on the bottom left. You have to check off to share sound. Uh -huh. So if you stop sharing your screen and reshare. Yeah. I've never done that, so what the? Too many windows. Okay. <laughs> stop sharing. And share again. Share again, but look on the bottom left. Oh, yeah. And you'll see a share sound. Okay, let's try this. <laughs> Excuse me. Deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA, yeah, consists yes. of two polynucleotide chains. Each one is made up of four types of nucleotide subunits, which consist of a single phosphate group and a nitrogen-containing base, adenine A, cytosine C, guanine G, 
or thymine T, attached to a sugar deoxyribose. This arrangement creates the sugar phosphate backbone of the DNA structure. On one strand, the sugar is oriented with the hydroxyl group exposed at the third carbon atom, which is ready to covalently link to another sugar molecule in the chain at the fifth carbon atom via phosphodiester bonds. In the opposing anti-parallel strand, each base is uniquely paired, C with G and A with T, thanks to differences in the number of hydrogen bonds that form between them. Such chemical polarity ensures efficient packing, winding the two strands around each other to form a 3D double helix with 10 base pairs every full turn. All right. And let's go back. And because we're talking about mutation, here's another very short video on, so we talked about DNA now, and this is a mutation. Point mutations, where a single nucleotide is changed, can produce a protein that is totally normal or completely non-functional, depending on the type. These include silent, missense, nonsense, and frame shift mutations. Silent mutations, as the name implies, have no effect on the amino acid sequence of a protein. For instance, if the codon CCA is changed to CCG, it will still encode for the amino acid proline, and the protein will function normally. Missense mutations, on the other hand, result in the substitution of one amino acid for another, such as arginine instead of proline, which can cause the protein to malfunction. Nonsense mutations occur when a codon for an amino acid is changed to a stop codon. This signals the cell to stop translation, resulting in a prematurely truncated protein that is often non-functional. Finally, frame shift mutations occur when the reading frame, how the sets of three nucleotides are grouped into codons, is shifted often due to the insertion or deletion of one or more nucleotides. This results in a series of new codons encoding for different amino acids, creating an abnormal protein. All right, so, um, so again, tell me what you think of these videos, and I guess it will give you a flavor of the type of stuff you might see. But it, this is very relevant and something that uh, I think is always good to review, especially if you don't use these concepts uh, often in the, in the clinic. And just to remind you, you know, the dogma, you go from DNA to RNA to protein, protein being the functional unit, mRNA being the template that's used to generate the protein. Um, so so these, this is important because these are the different levels of investigation that you could use. You could use investigation to look at DNA, like sequencing, RNA, where you look at the level of these transcripts in a cell or their position, uh, like uh, in situ hybridization, for example, and protein, where you can use antibodies that will tell you if the protein is expressed, where it is, and, and things like that. So this is uh, really important. And this is just a, a very rough cartoon of a cell just to remind you that uh, at the end of the day, that's uh, where, you know, if you're studying any diseases, you would like to, to study which cell is affected, does it make sense with the disease and things like that. And each cell has different types of organelles. Uh, and like, you probably have heard that about that in medical school or in, or in undergrad, you know, ribosomes and endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, nucleus, uh, the, the membrane. So these are all compartments that are really critical for the function of the cell. And what you can use is um, if you say your protein is supposed to be expressed in a certain compartment, let's say the endoplasmic reticulum, you can use markers of that uh, organelle to show where they are. And then you can stain for your protein of interest and see if it actually is in the organelle uh, where it belongs. And sometimes when you have a mutation, it just goes to the wrong spot. So that's why it's important to know about the cell biology. And here's another quick video about cells.
Cells are the building blocks of every organism, from single-celled bacteria to multicellular humans, and can be classified into two broad categories, prokaryotic and eukaryotic. Prokaryotes are relatively simple single-celled organisms that lack a nucleus, and with few exceptions, their internal components are not membrane-bound. For instance, DNA is freely bundled in the center, in a nucleoid. In contrast, eukaryotic cells have a membrane-bound nucleus. Their overall structure is more complex and compartmentalized, with specific organelles, specialized subunits like the mitochondria and endoplasmic reticulum, that perform distinct functions. Moreover, eukaryotic organisms, such as plants and animals, can vary in their exact cellular makeup. For example, a typical plant cell contains chloroplasts, while animal cells do not. Ultimately, understanding the structural complexity and how cells function is essential in learning about the biological world. All right. So, so after looking at the data long and hard, because they didn't find any mutations in any of the genes known to cause human diseases, they ended up selling on, on a, a gene called ARPC1B. doesn't really matter. It's just an excuse for this particular talk. Uh, but in, it, it was pretty convincing because in patient one, it was a, remember what we talk about in terms of mutations, it was a homozygous mutation in gene RPC1B. And this little string here just tells you it's in the protein, so P. It's a valine at position 91, so amino acid 91, uh, to tryptophan. And this means frame shift 30 bases away. So that will cause a, a frame shift. So it's really a terrible mutation. And it's almost like it, so chances are this patient is a knockout. Patient two and three are siblings, and they were compounded heterozygous, meaning they have two mutations, one from mom coming from mom, one coming from dad in the same gene. And in this case, you will notice, you know, just to review some of the concepts we've covered earlier, these are missense mutations going from one amino acid to a different one. Here, al uh, alanine. Uh, to valine at position 105 and alanine to threonine at position 238. And this is the cartoon of the protein here. The key question now, so you, you, you have three patients, but really two families with mut a rare mutation in the same gene. So is this really causal? So what does it mean? So while the first mutation looks bad, or we say pathogenic, meaning it causes disease, is it causal? Are the two missense mutation also causing a loss of function? Remember, so this is a this is clearly loss of function because the protein is probably not expressed. But these guys is just a missense mutation, is it? And here, what what could what could happen is if you change uh, the amino acid, you can change the structure, tertiary structure of the protein, and it's uh, targeted for degradation. You could be affecting a functional domain, as you can see here. They're in uh, WD40 uh, domains, doesn't really matter what it does, but proteins of functional domains. And if the mutation lands in one of those uh, sites, chances are you, you might be disrupting the function. But it's not a slam dunk when it's a missense mutation. So more data is needed to prove the association and you need to do a lot of basic science work to convince the community that it could be true. Just briefly, we talked about exome sequencing. You might have heard about uh, all exome sequencing. So the, the cartoon on the left just shows you the difference between the two uh, and with a little metaphor. So whole genome literally is meaning you, you sequence the whole thing. Okay, so three billion letters times two because you've got every chromosome twice, from mom and from dad. And that it comprises exons, introns, and intergenic areas. So exons are the coding regions that make proteins. Introns are in between the exons of a gene, and intergenic areas are this junk DNA that is between genes, but it's not so junk uh, anymore. And the, the Apple cartoon just gives you an example of the, the magnitude of, of data that you get. So the exon is just 1% of the genome, whereas the whole genome is the whole thing. And so this these are genome-wide type of sequencing. Okay, so you get you get the whole thing. The other type of sequencing you might have heard about that is something that we commonly do ourselves in the lab. And if any of you were to go in a lab, you could probably learn that in a couple of weeks max. 
is Sanger sequencing. And this works basically by, you need to know your, how to navigate the, the genome, but as long as you have the sequence, you can design these primers that are like this, that will have a sequence that really match the, the piece of DNA that you want to amplify. And you will have two at the, about let's say 200 base pairs from each other or 300, whatever you want, up to a thousand. And then what happens is you can very selectively amplify only that segment of DNA exponentially. So, you, so your sample becomes chock full with only that segment of DNA and then you can send it out for sequencing. And then you get something like this, the chromatogram. Remember the letters from the video? You know, the A, C, T, G, and you, you remember which one is which uh, in terms of the, uh, the pairing. So here, this is just an example of a wild type sequence. So this is what we know is supposed to be there in the genome. So it's a string of Gs, then two Ts, then more Gs, and a T. And the patient here, as, as you can see, the different colors uh, show you the different uh, letters. And this patient is a, has a G to A mutation at this specific site. And because you're seeing the G and you're seeing the A, it means you're heterozygous. Remember our patients were homozygous. So the wild type would be like this and the mutant would be full A. There would be no uh, G at this position. So this would just be a green peak meaning it's completely homozygous. So this is how it looks when we, uh, when we look at it, uh, you know, on, when we investigate ourselves. And in fact, nowadays, most of the investigations are done by whole exome sequencing. But if you get the lab to do it for you, like clinical lab, they will always uh, verify that the mutation is indeed present by Sanger sequencing. So this is still part of the, uh, of the protocol. Once you confirm a mutation, and they did, so remember this, this patient has a very big problem with platelets. Uh, they were very small and dysfunctional. And platelets are pretty easy to access uh, because they're just in the blood. So uh, a lot easier to investigate. Uh, you can also have access to the bone marrow. Uh, so here, what they did is they first did a method called Western blotting. And to do that, what you do is you extract the blood, you isolate the platelets, you can use detergents to extract the proteins, and then you can run them on a gel, okay? Uh, that will, uh, I will show you a video that uh, shows that pretty good, pretty well. So you run them on a gel that will uh, separate them by size, then you transfer it onto a membrane using you know, electrical current, and then you can probe that membrane with antibodies to show you is the protein expressed, yes or no? Uh, and is it uh, different, what level, and, and uh, is it migrating at the uh, size that you expect uh, using an antibody? So you probe the membrane with an antibody that's specific for your protein of interest. So let's just see this. Uh, so that's a technique you might not be uh, familiar with. So. Western blotting is a powerful technique utilized by many researchers to identify the presence of specific proteins in an electrophoretically separated sample using antibodies. There are three principal stages of this technique that are essential for a quality outcome. Electroblotting, immunoblotting, and detection. Before these stages are attempted, SDS Page in which denatured proteins are separated by size in a polyacrylamide gel must be performed. Electroblotting is also known as the Western transfer and requires a transfer cassette for holding together the sandwich as well as an apparatus for transferring protein from an acrylamide gel to a thin membrane. The electroblotting sandwich consists of the gel and a specialized membrane sandwiched between two pieces of filter paper. During the transfer, an electric field is used to move the proteins through the gel where they become trapped on a membrane due to charged and hydrophobic interactions. Immunoblotting uses antibodies to probe the membrane for specific proteins. Antibodies are large Y-shaped proteins that contain two fragments, 
also known as Fab regions, which bind to other proteins. The Fab region defines the specific epitope or specific portion of a protein to which an antibody will bind. Monoclonal antibodies are antibodies that recognize a single epitope and are the preferred antibody type used for immunoblotting due to their specificity. In contrast, polyclonal antibodies are a series of different antibodies that target many epitopes on the same antigen or protein for which an antibody has specificity. Monoclonal antibodies that recognize a linear epitope are preferred, as that ensures the epitope can be found on a denatured or linearized protein. This is important because many antibodies only recognize conformational epitopes, which means they recognize proteins in their native 3D state only. In addition to FAB fragments, antibodies contain an FC region, which is specific to the animal that produced the antibody. In immunoblotting, this region is mainly utilized as the epitope for a secondary antibody, an antibody which recognizes the first antibody that is bound to the protein you're trying to detect. In order to produce an observable signal, antibodies are often linked through their FC region to a reporter enzyme, such as alkaline phosphatase or horseradish peroxidase. These reporter enzymes produce signals by reacting with substrates to cause color changes or produce light changes. These changes can then be quantified using densitometry. Densitometry is the technique used to measure the density of a protein band using image analysis software to calculate the density of each band. The bands can then be directly quantified using reference standards or internally controlled using a control sample. All right. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to, to, uh, to chime in. But the, uh, so basically the, the point is that you can do all these steps. Uh, it, this one takes a little bit longer to learn to do uh, quite nicely. And you do need a very good antibody if you want specific results. Uh, but it, uh, but it's, uh, it's a very good technique. Um, any questions from anyone? about this? You know, if you have questions about monoclonal, polyclonal, or the, 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 they mentioned something about, you know, the secondary antibody needed to be specific to the species. Um, maybe I can have a word about this. So for example, if, it, if your antibody is produced in goat, you will need a secondary antibody that will recognize the FC portion of the antibody from goats, which is always the same FC portion. So then you will use a, let's say a donkey anti-goat secondary antibody or a rabbit anti-goat. Uh, so that's, that's what it means. And, it, and th these are sort of the small details that you need to know when you do these experiments, because if you use a the wrong secondary antibody, your experiment is not gonna work. So is it expressed in platelets? So here we have a Western blot. You have the molecular weight markers on the right-hand side in Kittle Dalton. Uh, so this would be a small protein, you know, uh, to give you a perspective, uh, albumin is 67. N is the control, uh, P1 is the first patient, and P2 and P3 are the two siblings. Remember, P1 is the one that has a loss of function mutation, and you can see ARP-C1B has a very thick band at the expected molecular weight around probably 40 in the control. There's nothing in the uh, P1 patient and a very faint band in P2 and P3, which probably means that a lot of it is being degraded, but there's a little bit that remains and it makes sense with the patient that has a missense mutation. So that's, that confirms uh, what they thought, that the protein is not there, so that's, that's good. The, then they took it to a different level because this protein is known, so this is a crystal structure, it doesn't really matter what it is. The point is, uh, where is RC1B? RC1 is there, and it interacts with a lot of other proteins that are part of the same family. And when you have a mutation in a protein and interacts with many other proteins, sometimes you will disrupt the complex and you will get wrong expression of many of the other proteins. So the second question was, uh, are these other members of the family affected? And they use Western blood again to test for that. And it turns out, I told you this is RC1B, well, it's no surprise that there's RC1A as well. And sometimes these genes are 
very close, really closely related, but they have slightly different functions. But if you have one missing, the other one uh, can have increased expression uh, as a as a means by which the cell can try to compensate. And lo and behold, I remember so this is the same uh, um, columns. So the first one is uh, normal P1, P2, and P3. Very interesting that ARPC1A here is increased, but because the patients have a, a dramatic phenotype, this is almost like uh, you can imagine the cells going crazy because ARPC1B is not there. They try to upregulate something that's related, but clearly it cannot compensate even though it's closely related and you still get a massive phenotype. But this is the cells trying to do something to compensate. And on the right-hand side here, they, the investigators tested for the other members of the complex. Uh, and you can see that none of them seem to care in the least about this. Uh, so chances are the, the complex might not be as functional because it's missing one piece, but it's not affecting the expression of the other one. And these are very helpful clues to figure out what is the underlying biology. Uh, in some instances, what happens is all of these other proteins, even though the gene is completely normal, because the complex cannot form, the other proteins just get degraded, meaning that you, you, you could have gotten, you know, a, the equivalent of a knockout for, you know, six genes but this is not uh, what seems to be happening here. So conclusion, the expression of the other uh, members of the complex are unaffected. RPC1A is increased versus the control. Uh, and even though they're close relatives, it doesn't compensate for the functional absence of RPC1B. So it gives you some insights into the possible pathophysiology. So what, what are the platelet abnormalities? So it's second level question. So now you show that the gene product is not there, which is not surprising, but does it affect how the protein uh, look in a way? Uh, and in this case, what they resolved uh, to use is uh, immunostaining, which is a technique that's quite similar to the probing of the Western blot, except you're, you're doing it either on cells that are cultured or you're doing it on tissue. Uh, so we'll just uh, look, uh, watch another quick video about this. And I'll just stop here for a minute. This means, so this is immunohistochemistry and immunocytochemistry. So these, this just means using antibodies. Histo means tissue and chemistry just means you're you know, you're using uh, chemicals to, 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 to stain the tissue. So this is staining of tissue and the other one clearly is staining of cells. So basically it's the same type of immuno staining, but one is tissue, the other one is cells. Immunocytochemistry and immunohistochemistry are staining methods for a protein of interest in cultured cells and tissues respectively. The basic principle of both related techniques involves using specific antibodies tagged with a detection system to identify and visualize the protein and determine its location within the cells and tissues, as well as the relative levels. The process in either experiment begins with sample preparation. For immunocytochemistry, which specifically visualizes protein or antigen locations in cells, this involves three steps. The first step is plating, which entails culturing the cells in growth media on a cover slip or slide, typically in the wells of a culture plate. This is followed by fixation, where a precipitating or cross-linking agent like paraformaldehyde is added to the cells to preserve the structural integrity of the proteins and prevent enzyme activity from degrading them. The last step is permeabilization, which involves adding a detergent to make the cell membranes permeable for the staining. In the counterpart method, immunohistochemistry, Proteins or antigens are visualized in tissues, and sample preparation has five steps. First, the whole tissue is subjected to fixation, usually with paraformaldehyde. This is followed by embedding of the tissue in a block of paraffin. 
and then sectioning of this block using a machine called a microtome to cut the tissue into thin slices which can be placed onto slides. Next, the slides are subjected to deparaffinization or removal of the paraffin from around the tissue slice. Then, an optional antigen retrieval step can be performed. This can either be done using heat or enzymes to unmask epitopes that were cross-linked during fixation, making them available for antibody binding. After the appropriate sample preparation, a target-specific primary antibody is added to the cell or tissue sample. This primary antibody should bind to the protein of interest. Next, a secondary antibody is added, which detects and binds to the primary antibody. This secondary antibody is conjugated to, or can bind to, an enzyme called HRP. When its specific substrate DAB is added, HRP converts this to an insoluble brown precipitate. This brown stain marks the location of the target protein. The slides are also stained with hematoxylin, which labels the nuclei in blue and provides a spatial reference point for determining subcellular localization. After that, mounting media is added to the slide followed by a cover slip in order to seal and preserve the stained sample. Finally, the slides can be imaged on a light microscope. In this video, you will observe the sample preparation technique for plated cells and tissue sections, followed by immunostaining of the tissue section. So, okay. And uh, by the way, these movies for the first minute or two is just a brief introduction with animations. But if you want to dig deep, there's usually another eight to 10 minutes where they, they show you exactly all the methodology uh, in a lab. So. Um, you can get uh, really what to see what it looks like. So here, what they did is they isolated platelets from controls or the patients, and they stained them. In this case, uh, which makes for really nice pictures, they used uh, uh, three antibodies. So they stained for tubulin in purple, P-selectin in red, and TSP1, which is another marker. It doesn't really matter what it is, in green. And how do you do this? So this is, we talked in the, in the video about uh, or reddish peroxidase, which is an enzyme that will sort of, you know, uh, splutter your tissue with brown uh, uh, color. Here, instead of adding the, the HRP on the antibody, the antibody is labeled with a fluorescent uh, marker that is either purple, red, or green when activated by a laser. The beauty of this approach is that you can use multiple antibodies on the same tissue and then do a merge as in this picture. And it gives you a beautiful uh, uh, localization of these different uh, epitopes. And you can even see things that are overlapping because you will see if, if red crosses with purple, will give you a diff uh, different color. If red overlaps with green, it'll give you a different color. Uh, and so it gives you a relative uh, 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 quantification, if you will, of the or, uh, degree of overlap between the different epitopes. And here it just shows you uh, what is normal ARPC1B null, and WASP is the uh, Wiskut Aldrich, uh, which is another uh, uh, disorder that affects platelets that uh, I guess the hematologists probably are familiar with. Uh, and this is used as a positive control because we know that these platelets are supposed to be small, uh, just like in ARPC1B, and their content is a bit. Uh, messed up to use a scientific term, which is exactly what we're seeing. Uh, so you can see that these normal platelets have nice uh, plumpy sort of red and green content with the normal purple, whereas RPC1B and, and WASP uh, or Viscotaldrich platelets uh, uh, are generally a bit smaller and with the very variable content. And what's interesting as well is they ended up uh, confirming that the RPC1, this is an electron microscopy uh, slide uh, showing that they have actually, uh, they do not have uh, normal, they do not have normal alpha granules. They're much lighter in, in density, uh, which is quite abnormal. So conclusion, the RPC1B deficient platelets have low alpha uh, granule content and variable uh, platelet content as well on, on immunofluorescence. 
And I just wanted to emphasize the concept of control. So here you have the normal versus mutant, but they added an extra level of control uh, by adding the uh, whiskey aldrich uh, syndrome platelets to show you, uh, you know, how it looks rel in relative terms uh, compared to another uh, syndrome that affects the platelets in a similar way. And then they wanted one more level of proof um, in this case, and they did not have a mouse model, which is one thing you can do. So you can knock out the gene in the mouse and see what happens, and the hope that the phenotype mimics the human but that is not possible. So what they ended up doing is using a technique called genome editing, uh, where you can basically create, you take a cell line, in this case of megakaryocytes, uh, for the non-hematologists in the audience, megakaryocytes are the cells in the bone marrow that will produce platelets. Uh, platelets do not have nuclei, so you can't really edit them. Uh, and anyway, they're produced by the megakaryocytes. So if you want to create abnormal platelets, you need to go at the root of the, or the, the producer of the platelet, the megakaryocyte. And there's multiple techniques to do gene editing. Uh, so, and it's uh, basically almost in the historical uh, lineup with the zinc finger nucleases, the talon, and now something that probably everybody has heard, the CRISPR. Uh, an acronym that I will not try to define for you because CRISPR is so much better. Uh, but all of these techniques basically will allow you to mess up, if you will, for, to use another uh, scientific term, uh, the DNA of your cells or tissues in a fairly specific uh, way. In fact, increasingly specific uh, way. And the, the point of doing this is you take a cell line and you say, if it's, it's one thing to take the patient cells and show that they have a problem, but to really prove that the problem is due to your mutation, what you want to take is a normal cell, induce the same mutation, and see if the same thing happens. Because it could all be due to a mutation in a different gene, since you're using the patient tissue and you know the platelets are abnormal in your patient. So let's just watch one last movie, I think. Let's just see. Genetic engineering is the modification of the genetic code, the DNA, of an organism. The nucleotide sequence of a gene may be changed using genome editing techniques such as CRISPR-Cas9. A gene could be removed or knocked out altogether, or a new one could be inserted. For instance, adding a gene from another species to create a transgenic organism. As a result, researchers and clinicians can alter the proteins produced by an organism. For example, in gene therapy, a gene can be introduced into a patient to produce a protein they are lacking, potentially curing their disease. Right, so it's a very brief uh, description of uh, gene editing, clearly, but uh, I guess it gives you a little bit of a flavor. Uh, and I believe in the document I gave you, there's a 10 minute long uh, video that explains this in, in quite a bit more detail. So here what they use is this cell line called, uh, so it's IMMKCL, immortalized megakaryocyte cell line. Okay, so it's immortalized. Immortalized mean that it doesn't die. It just keeps growing all the time. So clearly that's not great because it's, it's not normal, but it gives you the opportunity to study uh, disease uh, status. In a, in a more controlled fashion. What's really amazing here, so we come back to some techniques that we've already seen. This is Western blotting that you may see the familiar band, that the familiar molecular weight of RPC1B, you know, around 38, 40 uh, kilodalton. And wild type is just the regular flavor of megakaryocytes. SG2 is a uh, megakaryocyte that was engineered with CRISPR to uh, be a knockout, complete knockout of RPC1B with a, a deletion of the gene. And as you can see, the gene is not expressed. Tubulin here is used as a positive control because it is just a structural gene that is expressed in all cells. So if you want to do quantifications, you could do a ratio of this over that and this over that, but clearly there's nothing, so it's pretty clear. But you could use that as a relative uh, um, component of your equation, if you will, for uh, uh, 
to determine the re relative levels. And this is platelets here, normal platelets. So there's quite a bit of RPC1B and 2 billion is also expressed there. And what's remarkable, you may recall that one of the key results that was shown earlier was that the patient platelets had a very high level of RPC1A. And lo and behold, this is exactly what we see. So here, what they did is they took the cell lines, wild type versus knockout. They grew them so that they had a full lawn of cells. They extracted the two cell, cell lines with the detergent to extract the protein. They ran them through the gel, transferred it to the membrane, probed it with either an RPC1B antibody, an anti-tubulin antibody, or an RPC1A antibody. And this is what they saw. And uh, so basically they are reproducing exactly the abnormality that was seen in the patient platelets, but in this case, with a completely artificial system that is immortalized. And in fact, it's a megakaryocyte. So it's, uh, it's sort of the granddaddy of all the platelets or the grandmommy, but it's uh, remarkable that you've seen the same thing. And just to push the boundary a bit more and to review, it's a good occasion for us to review more of the stuff that we've already talked about. So here they use, so this is the same cells. So immortalized megakaryocyte cell line wild type and RPC1B null. And clearly it looks, it doesn't matter what we're seeing. We can talk about the details a little bit, but they, they look completely different, right? In one case, you've got all these nice, uh, uh, you know, structures that are jetting out from the cell. This is the nucleus here. And this one, the nucleus is here, but you just got a big blob with no projections. In this case, uh, some familiar names will come back. So tubulin here is stained with uh, in purple, CD61, F-actin, and DNA in blue. So F-actin is just, you know, the structural uh, uh, part of your uh, megakaryocyte. But that's pretty convincing that uh, you know megakaryocytes really need RPC1B to uh, uh, act normally. And typically, and the hematologist might correct me on this, but platelets would be these uh, projections would be coming out of the bone marrow and basically squirting out platelets from these structures. So it, it stands to reason that this uh, structure or this cell here is probably not a happy uh, a producer of platelets given its lack of uh, projection. So the cell lines here were great for in vitro work. Uh, these cells are also very good for transfection or transduction. So what does that mean, transfection and transduction? So it's another key concept. So transfection is, you trying to put something, uh, some genetic material or RNA or maybe even protein into your cells. And sometimes it's just brute force where you, you, you use the different techniques that we'll see in the video that allow you to do this. Transduction is usually for DNA material or CRISPR uh, uh, tools to genome edit your cell lines. And transduction is doing the same thing, but in a slightly more sneaky way, where you take advantage of viruses that you know are able to infect your cells of interest. And viruses, what they do is they dock onto your cell, and then their property is to basically unload their content into the cell. And, and then whatever was in your virus uh, can do its business in the cell. So it's a slightly uh, more elegant way of doing it. Although it means you need to engineer your virus to do what you want it to do. Uh, and just to, to uh, discuss that there's advantages and disadvantages to these cell lines that are immortalized, right? So you can, you have the advantage of being able to study the same cell over and over. You can transfect them or transduce them more easily. But immortality is not a property, uh, unfortunately, that uh, any of us uh, uh, possess. And, and it actually confers very abnormal properties to your cells. Uh, so you always have to take that with a grain of salt. That's why they, they try to study the, the, the problem multiple different ways to make sure that you know, it, it makes sense, that, they, that they're studying it. Uh, there's multiple levels of evidence that are building on each other. So let's just see this video here. And I think I need to bring it up to just a little bit forward.
Genetic engineering is a valuable tool will be excised from the genome. Okay. Whoops. Let's review a general procedure. Hold on a sec. I think I'm sorry guys, this is Genetic engineering is a valuable tool used to modify genomes of model organisms in a process known as transgenesis. In developmental biology, this approach is often used to express modified genes that can be visualized in living tissues. Alternatively, genetic engineering can be used to prevent or disrupt protein expression to study the developmental function of specific genes. This video will summarize the principles behind this technology, review some genetic engineering procedures, and highlight ways that these techniques are used in the lab. To begin... So I think we're... Whoops. So I think we're running out of time a little bit, so I'll just stop this. And let me just finish. Uh, so... Um, so why was this study important? It, uh, of course, it led to the diagnosis of these patients and will likely lead to the diagnosis of many others for whom the clinicians did not know what was going on. Could in principle help guide the design of uh, personal therapy uh, or even gene therapy. And also argues that the mutations in the other RPC uh, genes may cause the same phenotype. But to, to do this, adding the mutation in hand was not sufficient because this was a novel gene disease uh, association. So that's where all of these techniques of, um, you know, uh, basic science uh, came into play to provide additional layers of evidence that really convinced the community because this was published in a fairly good journal, Nature Communication. Uh, so it tells you that, uh, you know, uh, people were convinced that this was most likely a true uh, gene disease association. Uh, so I I don't know if it was a, I, I would appreciate if you let me know what you thought of using a, a paper as, a, as an excuse to review some of these concepts. I thought it would be more interesting. Um, and I'm more than happy to take any questions if anybody has. I think we have a few minutes. And if it was super duper clear, that's, uh, that's fine too. Well, that's great, Mathieu. Thank you. So we can take some questions if people want to raise their hand. I think you can raise your hand. Yeah, in the reaction section, and then I can call on you. There were some compliments in the chat box that they wish they had heard this talk earlier before embarking on the PhD. Uh, but let me ask you a question, Mathieu, just in general. So yep. as somebody who's done, doing basic science pretty well for a living in addition to clinical work, I guess some fellows have come and said, you know, they don't want to train with a basic science project because wherever they're going back to, for example, in Europe or the Middle East, they're not going to have a lab, um, you know, yep. and, and so it's sort of, it's almost wasted time for them. They'd rather do a, a basic clinical yep. project or something. So what, what yep. do you say to them? What made you go into the basic science? Why would it be a good idea for them to try out basic science? Excellent question. So what I would say to this is a couple of things. Uh, number one, I think you would need to commit at least a year, if not two, to get something out of it but you would not be at a level where you, you will get your own lab, I would say. So you get a good understanding of you know, experimental design, running experiments and doing things like that. And there's a, if you choose your product, project carefully, there's actually a few things you could do uh, on your own pretty much anywhere in the world. Uh, so for example, uh, I do genetics and I, many of my fellows go back to countries where they can't do uh, basic science experiments but they can definitely do Sanger sequencing. That's super cheap. All you need is to understand how to design the primers. You can mail your, it's super stable because it's DNA. You can ship it to anywhere. It's very cheap for sequencing. If you understand, if you've done it in the lab, that's something you could do. And then you could strike collaborations with basic scientists, but you give them 
especially let's say you, you come from a country where there's a lot of consanguinity and nobody is doing anything because nobody understands or can do a lab work, but you know how to do sequencing. Uh, you know, you could have a, 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 a rich group of patients that could be, uh, you know, uh, the, the source of investigations. You might be the one doing the basic science, but you're the one kickstarting the project. So your name will be quite uh, well placed in the paper if probably even senior author or co-senior, depending on the amount of work that's required to prove the association. But that's that would be to me the, the most obvious, especially if a, a trainee has an interest in genetics, especially given the advance, you know, with gene therapy and all of that. I think that would be a very, very good way of uh, moving to the lab. And, and I think some fun in the lab as well. You know, Absolutely. I think there's a lot of opportunity question. for collaboration, yeah. right? You can find collaborators. And now we're not limited to collaborators in our city or in our country even, right? We can, so exactly. if you have samples, if you have patients with unique conditions, I think that's a huge opportunity to understand what your basic science collaborators might need. And the other thing I always a, tell. Yeah, go for it. No, I was just going to say, I always tell fellows, this is it, right? This is the last time you're going to be able to try this thing out called basic science before you get a job and you may fall in love with it. I didn't think I was going to be a clinician scientist when I started my fellowship at Sick Kids. I liked research, but I didn't think I would be doing research most of my day. And I fell in love with it because I gave it a chance. So you may end up falling in love with it and deciding to extend your training and doing a postdoc fellowship or a PhD. And so, you know, if you're excited by something, give it a try. Not exactly. So it's, uh, like you say, it's an opportunity. And if you don't do it now, it's not going to happen. And it's, it, whatever you learn, there's gen general principle that will be applicable to anything. Even I think it, it makes you a better clinician because you, you, you're not afraid of reading the literature. You learn how to think a bit more, you know, scientifically, because let's, let's face it, medicine is not exactly scientific thinking. It's trying to get better with the evidence base. Uh, but uh, I think when the evidence is in basic papers, a lot of clinicians just uh, recoil, you know, but if, you, if you've done a bit of research, you've read some papers, maybe you wrote the paper yourself, you're not afraid at all anymore. And then that whole throw of information is available to you. For sure. Any um, other questions? I don't see any other hands. And we're past 2.30, just another compliment. Love the so, use of relevant uh, paper to guide us. Yeah, please please give me feedback uh, on on the format, on the use of the video. It was a bit, uh, it was the first time I was doing this, so it was not great, but uh, I think it worked okay. Uh, also about the document, tell me what you think, or if you have any problems, you know, having access to the videos or the chapters, let me know. Uh, and uh, um, that way we can make it better for the future trainees. Excellent. And Linda will collect some feedback afterwards. She'll send around a survey with feedback for afterwards. Right. If you can fill that out, that's great. All right. Awesome. Thank you very much, Mathieu. Appreciate it. Guys. And yeah, I no hope problem. everybody enjoys their afternoon. Stay safe, everyone.